I think is going to occur in the next 24 to 36 months is hybridized breakthroughs, where the value of supporting an application that leverages computer vision with natural language processing for a robot to assist with hazardous location inspections or confined space inspections where it's very dangerous or impossible for a human to do that work. Welcome to the Trailblazers podcast presented by BST Global, where we feature the visionaries who are shaping the AEC industry of the future. My name is Javier Baldor, Chief Executive Officer at BST Global and your host. Today, I'm joined by Kevin Switala, Chief Technology Officer at Gannett Fleming. Welcome, Kevin. Excited to have you here with us today on our podcast. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me on. So tell us, tell us about Gannett Fleming. Over a hundred year old firm, tremendous reputation, and tell us about your story as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, how long do we have? Yeah. <laughs> we are quickly approaching 110 years wow. as a civil engineering firm, uh, typically uh, grown out of a central location, like most family run businesses are, centered in Pennsylvania. And we had our early years in civil engineering, primarily in the water industry and the transportation industry. And we have this rich history of working all over the world, working in big infrastructure projects, everything from large water, wastewater programs, uh, dams and levees, large-scale transportation, so anything roads, highways, bridges, airport work, uh, especially transit and rail, and it's just an exciting variety of activity. We specialize in not just the architecture work, but also the engineering that goes into large-scale infrastructure, and then the construction management oversight, so we do the full circuit of an asset in its entire life cycle. Awesome. Tremendous uh, reputation, I might add. Uh, tell us about your, your personal story, your, your journey uh, to Gannett Fleming and yeah. at Gannett Fleming. Yeah, so I've been here, hard to believe, uh, close to 25 years at this point. I was working for the city of Philadelphia for a few years after grad school, working in a specializing in a computer-aided technology called geographic information systems, anything mapping, and fell in love with that. And I had a colleague who went through college and grad school ahead of me, and he worked for Gennett Fleming as a planner, and he enticed me to come on board back in the late 90s. And I came on board into a division that specialized in that mapping technology and worked for them for 18 years, working my way up from an entry-level analyst slash developer um, slash data analyst all the way up through project manager and then operations supervisor and operations um, manager for the division itself prior to having the opportunity to transition from the front office to the back office and take on the chief technology officer role in 2018. So from that point forward, uh, looking at technology holistically across the organization has been filled with challenges, but filled with some real exciting opportunities too. Well, you may have been ahead of your time. The data analyst is a data, today's data scientist. So you were, Absolutely. Way, you were way ahead of your uh, of your time. Talk about the challenges you had to overcome. You, you alluded to some there. What, what are some of those challenges that, you know, in your career you overcame with, uh, with resilience? Yeah, I would say when you transition roles from within a singular division that may consult or may operate with other divisions of a large organization with the complexity of Ghana Fleming, you learn and have certain knowledge base that you can draw upon when you're thrust into an organizational role that forces you to quickly and rapidly assimilate many other domains of knowledge that you have not been exposed to before. You're proverbially drinking from many fire hoses. Mm -hmm. So the first of which was just how do I assimilate the information that counts? And throughout my career, doing many, many different kinds of strategic planning projects in geographic information systems for public and private sector work, the clients we were working with were very diverse. So there's always a ramping up position, finding what was essential for that organization, how it worked, what were the business drivers. And that was the same mentality that I had to bring to this role. I say the second of which is starting to really understand at a much deeper level the difference between how an engineer thinks how an architect thinks, and how a construction professional think. 
I often find that construction <laughs> professionals think in terms of 18 to 36 months, maybe even shorter period of time, because that's the lifetime of something they're building. That's true. The architect is thinking in terms of maybe 40, 50 years, because that's the foreseeable lifespan of a piece of architecture they're working on. The engineer for big infrastructure thinks in terms of 100 plus years. Mm -hmm. And there's a thinking, there's a mindset that goes along with how they work and the use of technology that you have to assimilate and understand as a technology leader and language that you need to use for each of those different groups and to actually help them collaborate properly. Oftentimes, I'm helping translate between those different ideologies and mindsets. Um, I was going to talk to you a little bit later, but we'll, we'll, we'll tag on to it right now, architect, engineer, contractor. Um, how do you lead, how do you influence across those different mindsets, mm. uh, approaches, timescales of, of how they think? What is your personal leadership style, your, your ethos, uh, and how do you influence and lead across mm. those stakeholders? Yeah, that's a, a great opportunity to identify emergent leaders within groups that are influencers. So you build a network of influencers that you continue to maintain contact with and cultivate. And those influencers are who you go to to vet new ideas before you're going to make a decision. You're always listening to your own team members from a technical perspective, but many technical professionals have their blinders on about how they apply technology within their business. So by going into the operational units and really understanding and developing partnerships with key influencers, you can really have a good balance between what I think of as the golden triangle. It's people, process, and technology. And that's common in our industry. I don't know who coined that many, many years ago, but for me, people and processes are on top. Technology is subservient. If you can figure out the people and the processes and help drive leadership decisions based on those two, the technology solutions are aplenty. You will always find a technical solution for what people need to do with processes effectively. So we're gonna go around that horn there. We're gonna probably start with technology and then mm -hmm. see how um, you know, how, how, how people and, and process certainly tie into that. But, you know, there's this little thing called AI. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of <laughs> a it. A too little word. Yeah. Too little words. Uh, it's taking the world by storm, uh, as you well know. Um, talk to me about the impact. Um, a lot of hype. Um, mm -hmm. Some may question the amount of hype. Um, your personal take on it. What kind of impact will it have on our industry? Moderate, uh, meaningful, transformative. Where in that spectrum do you, do you uh, see it fall? Yeah, you know, Gartner has, Gartner has their typical hype cycle and AI is ready to fall off the, preface, <laughs> yes. the precipice of hype and into the trough of disillusionment, I believe they call it. I am very optimistic that AI will have not just a profound, but a profoundly beneficial impact on our industry. There is a significant amount of angst and gnashing of teeth and concern about job loss. Mm -hmm. But I look at this at the same time, our industry is facing a massive exodus of our most knowledgeable workforce members, boomers that are going off to retirement. And we're looking to backfill as rapidly as we can, but we have this incredible knowledge gap. AI and generative AI especially, really provides us an opportunity to have partners, a partnership between a technology that can facilitate the maturity and partner with an individual that may have less experience in a role that they just need to play mm -hmm. and don't have 20 years to assimilate the knowledge and the experience that the wise project manager ahead of them had. So I think as an assistant, as a partner, as a collaborator, I think one plus one equals four in this case. So I truly believe that we will go through that disillusionment period over the next few years, but we cannot ignore the profound impact in every dimension of our role, every dimension of our organization, every dimension of our industry that AI is going to play. Well, um, let's, let's come home closer to Gannett Fleming. What's the top priority uh, and plan investment at Gannett Fleming uh, as it relates to, to AI? 
and, and why as you execute your AI, your AI playbook? And what's the prize you hope to achieve? Mm -hmm. um, we are a private company. We're a for-profit company. Let's no, make no bones about that. So we're looking to leverage technology and enhance our processes to identify efficiencies and optimizations. So one of our big roles right now is how do we optimize and then automate? It's not just automating bad, inefficient processes. It's optimizing those processes as much as possible and then automating them. AI can play a role in both of those. It can help inform how do you optimize an inefficient process. And then oftentimes it is the technology that you use and leverage to automate a process. I believe AI is helping us draw keen insights with information at our disposal right now that we may not have drawn had we just looked at it from the human bias perspective. So it's making leaps that we may not have, drawing insights that we may not have. But everything is about profitability and growth of the organization. We have to recognize that we will have fewer licensed, experienced professionals in many different roles because there is a dearth of opportunities that are open job placements and a lack of people to fill those roles. We have to find another way, especially with the IIJA, the Infrastructure Spending Act, uh, really pouring so much needed funding into our industry. We have to find new ways, novel ways to increase productivity. Really, it's about increasing productivity is the real goal that we have as an organization. So you talk about this um, opportunity. Um, some may say IIJA, uh, generational spend for mm -hmm. infrastructure, as we well know. Resource shortage, retirements, all these things that are well said uh, that, that are happening. Um, how are we going to upskill uh, the folks. How do you plan to upskill the talented professionals you have in your team and, and really beyond uh, mm -hmm. in, in at Gannon Fleming? What does that strategy look like? Where are you finding that uh, next generation worker? Uh, is it different than where you're looking now? Uh, mm -hmm. Thoughts? Yeah, I think we are by no means lowering the bar, but we're able to widen the aperture of individuals that reside in places that we may not have attracted talent from before, that come to us from backgrounds that we may not have thought about and appreciated the diverse skill set they do bring, especially individuals that are more technologically savvy and friendly, maybe not experienced with technology, mm -hmm. but from a generation, whether you're talking millennials or Gen Zs, that grew up with this kind of technology and have a natural facility and a comfort level that maybe more seasoned workforce members don't naturally have, that gives us the opportunity to partner them with the remaining extremely knowledgeable workforce, but also partner them with co-pilot-like capabilities. Many of the platforms we're using have aspirations, if not already putting in place, assisted artificial intelligence enabling capabilities. BST, Autodesk, Bentley, Microsoft, these will only help aid in our upskilling and reskilling existing workforce members, bringing young junior workforce members to build from the bottom. But it also gives us something else. I truly believe we have an opportunity to still harness the knowledge of let's say recently retired workforce members that may want to extend their career, but not go full time, not even hourly, but on bit work, almost thinking of it as ephemeral jobs, gig work for boomers that still want to have some connectivity, but may allow assistive technology like AI to connect with young workforce members completely remotely through different means than we have available to us now. So I think of that as an opportunity to leverage remote workforce that brings all that experience but doesn't want to leave home anymore. Wow, that's fascinating. So almost taking that experience that has been uh, accumulated, hard-earned, however you want to mm -hmm. frame that, for decades, perhaps pairing it with that digital native, uh, a prompt engineer to help teach, train the models, and uh, multiply that uh, 
that productivity curve. Interesting. That is uh, exactly right. It's building the reference models based yes. on their experience that then work with natural language with the other individual learning along the way yes. so that there may not need to be connectivity between the new workforce member and the retired workforce member. There is something in the middle that is the coach, that is the mentor, that can act in a different way based on the time and availability of the new workforce member that may not align to the recent retired yeah. member with all their wisdom. Wow, that, that's, that's very cool. Uh, talk to me about risks, right? Uh, everybody loves the upside of AI. <laughs> we all do. Easy to talk about. Uh, talk about the downside. We talk about privacy, attribution of content, uh, algorithmic bias, disinformation, and, and the list goes on. Thoughts there. How, how can you achieve this prize mm -hmm. uh, while mitigating this downside risk? Yeah, I think we as an industry are naturally insulated in many ways. We as an industry have a hundreds and hundreds of years track record of calculate, then calculate again, and then validate and verify again. So it's trust but verify and verify the verification. So level one, level two plus verification is something in our DNA as an organization. Because if we get a calculation wrong and the bridge isn't designed properly, it fails and unfortunately potentially in je jeopardizes lives. So I think we will always have a certain level of trust, but really work hard as an organization and an industry to help understand what is the output. And it could be a novel output by generative AI and help define rules and analyze and verify how did it get there. The design industry has certainly been doing this for four or five years now, designing new physical components with leaps of logic that we may never have made. Now we need to take that same approach, but always trust and verify the calculations, verify the output. Um, but again, I think we're, we're pretty well positioned to do that. Mm. Who owns this IP that we're all talking about? Everything is generative. Um, have, you, have you thought through or contemplated the, the IP, uh, whether it's uh, not necessarily risk, but you mm -hmm. know, the ownership and, 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 and those kind of things? Just, uh, you know, yeah. just a, a question there. You know, what's interesting, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to listen to Ethan Mollick, and he is a renowned AI pioneer with the University of Pennsylvania. And he said something interesting, he said, all you private companies and the federal government think you have vast reservoirs of data that represent crown jewels. It really doesn't matter anymore. These LLMs are developed upon massive data stores that you could never contemplate. There is so much, regardless of your industry, of that same data in the public domain, because so many of you work in the public sector, that it can very quickly within the next 18 to 24 months come up with the same kind of results based on public data or data that was trained on that you may come up with with your own prized possessions behind your firewall as you're trying to develop your own LLMs. So don't even worry about it. It's going to make leaps of logic and progress at such a fast pace that within the next two years, it will outpace anything you're going to do internally with your own precious data. Um, and it's a little humbling to hear it that. It is, isn't it? So it's very, actually very humbling because I was going to segue into really unlocking your data. And you're, you're, you're saying, really, the, the crown jewel that may sit in your house uh, may not be so prized as you're describing it. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, thoughts in terms of your, your, your data strategy at Cannon Fleming. Talk to me uh, uh, or us, the viewers, about that in terms of how you see it unfolding, not only with the crown jewel in your house, mm -hmm. um, but also how do you plan to leverage uh, structured and unstructured data, perhaps outside of, uh, outside of Gannon Fleming? Yeah, that's a, a good question. We embarked about five years ago on an enterprise knowledge management strategy. And we didn't know at that time what kinds of data would be valuable for us in the future. It's at the time where data storage became extremely cheap, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, it's at a time where we began creating much greater quantities, magnitudes of data in the work we were doing as an engineering firm. And it also came at a time where there were glimmers 
of tools and enabling technologies. You know, AI five, six years ago was still very primitive. We hadn't seen the breakthroughs of the last 24 months. So we started to look at how do we realm, how do we harness and start to gather in both structured and unstructured data. And I would say our unstructured data is profoundly valuable to us, regardless of what Mr. Mollick says, because there are inherent lesson learns documented. There are inherent risks in risk matrices documented. And there are thousands of them at this point that lie throughout our data stores. During this journey, we start to centralize on the Microsoft Cloud our unstructured and structured data in combination with one or more design platforms that our industry uses. So every project has back office administrative data centrally stored in Microsoft's cloud and the other side in one design platform. So we're down to two locations for all of our structured or unstructured data for all of our projects for four or five years now. So that's how we have looked to really gather in from the multitude of different repositories of data to centralize that structure. Now, I still don't know exactly how we're going to harness that data, how we can leverage it in combination with LLMs and how we might use it for other kind of applications of artificial intelligence. But I'm okay with not knowing that roadmap right now. We're all figuring this out together. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe uh, to, to further that, that sentiment, against the backdrop of what's been, you know, come into play here in, in recent months, um, what are you personally curious about? What, what are you curious about learning um, in the coming months uh, on this subject? Yeah. I really want to find combinations of AI applications that work together to harness not just what has been stovepipe applications. There is natural language processing and people use that by itself. There is computer vision and it's being used in isolation. There's robotics and that's being used in isolation. What I think is going to occur in the next 24 to 36 months is hybridized breakthroughs where the value of supporting an application that leverages computer vision with natural language processing for a robot to assist with hazardous location inspections or confined space inspections where it's very dangerous or impossible for a human to do that work. And a individual is guiding that robot through that inspection process using natural language to provide cues for that robot to assimilate data in real time, and the AI is processing that multi-sensor data, becomes something that is achievable within the next few years. Robotics is advancing quickly enough. AI applications are certainly advancing quickly enough. So that's one of them. Uh, there's a couple more in brewing in my head. <laughs> I would just say the other one is really, it's um, when do we all become cyborgs? Because I think a breakthrough in our industry for the field worker is harnessed wearable technology that helps monitor and allows the individual with a hands-free ability to narrate and capture observations, but also technology that can monitor the health of that individual. Is their pulse racing because they're in a confined space and they're too tough to tell their supervisor, I don't want to be down here anymore? is their respiration and their blood pressure or their body temperature increase beyond a threshold because they're getting overheated, they're getting stressed, and they're worried about articulating something, and their supervisor doesn't see and recognize the physical symptoms. Those are all things that look at wearable technology that is similar in the sports industry now. And judging and valuating and managing playing time on the field and scalar muscular issues that arise. Wow, that's fascinating, um, Kevin. That's, that's truly fascinating. Any final uh, observations? Looking, depending on what horizon you foresee, um, three years, five years, what does that look like? Mm. Um, we, we sit down for an interview like this three years from now, five yeah. years from now. Uh, you would say, wow, I didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. What is that? 
in your in your mind. Yeah. Outside the great examples you just shared, what what is that? Wow, that came out of left field. I think that we are going to have the ability within a much shorter time than we might expect to have direct connectivity between our neural structures and artificial neural structures. I think that we are probably three or four years away from direct connectivity between how we think and an agent that is sitting outside of us, but bi-directional, not quite the matrix, but <laughs> I think we've seen even with- I was just with, about to say, that's yeah, a lot like the matrix. Yeah. Even uh, the rudimentary work that we're seeing now with neural enablers to control artificial limbs or individual physical limbs that are part of a body and signaling to muscular tissue to act and nerve tissues to do what they're doing. Um, I think that is a breakthrough that is going to come sooner than us figuring out a new battery technology, which we're also desperately in need of, but <laughs> I'm, I'm putting the, 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 my money behind neural links faster. Kevin, a fascinating discussion. Thank you for joining us uh, on the Trailblazers podcast. Wish you and Gannon Fleming uh, all the best and much continued success. We'll have to look back maybe in three to five years, do another interview, play this tape back. And, and see, see what we've gotten see right. See what we've got, but yeah. uh, I'm, I'm betting on you. But uh, thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, and thank you all for joining us on this segment of the Trailblazers podcast. Until next time.